welcome. This is the automated version of the Brevard Christian Church. <laughs> welcome podcast. to the year. This is the future. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Day. I was just kidding. I don't know what got into me. This is the Brevard Christian Church podcast. What a privilege to share this with everyone listening and some people watching. Thank you. Uh, it's such a neat privilege to get to talk about what we do as a group of believers and some of this, some of this discussion, we've been in Acts chapter two, verse forty-two, and we've kind of spiraled off to some other scriptures about what we do when we get together. What 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 does this church do? Uh, this church of Jesus, it, it gives rise to a lot of neat uh, reminders of things throughout the years. That I, I, full disclosure here, I think it's easy to make it sound like you know we figure this out, like we know what God says. It's clear. It's simple on what the church does, and that is very true. Yeah. The principles are laid out very clearly uh, in Scripture, but how you apply those principles, it is definitely a learning process for all of us. We spent most of last session talking about giving, Mm. and for years, the way that was done was you pass around a golden-colored uh, plate that <laughs> yeah. you know dish that they people are so supposed ornate. to drop at least five or ten bucks in. It's yep. just given, yep. and you give dollar bills to your kids so that they can drop money in too and, and yeah. kind of puff their chest out. It was just kind of the way it was done. Why? Because the principle is trying to be applied. But then we realize Second Corinthians chapter eight and chapter nine. God loves a hilarious, cheerful, not doing it under grudging circumstance or feeling compulsory to give, you know, com- right. compulsion. So uh, we, we went away from that. And, and in our experience here at our church in Merritt Island, the giving didn't go down. Mm. Did not go down. The giving you know, just went up. Yeah. And these these uh, practical application, it gives me an opportunity to say one of the uh, one of the things that we have done as ministers here on um, being part of the staff is we have asked the elders not to disclose to us who gives what. It makes it easier for us to minister to people when I go to visit somebody or I'm talking to somebody or leading a Bible study. When I look at three or four people uh, sitting on the front row, I don't know if one of them gives half of what they make and the other two or three people don't give a penny. I I have Mm -hmm. no idea. And it just makes it a lot easier. Let's just tell you what God's truth is. Yes. Now, inadvertently, from time to time, you find out uh, 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 accidentally, can I say, (laughs) uh, how people give. But one one thing that we have asked from the elders and our bookkeeper, and we get this from time to time, we want to know how many active participant families we have in our database. So let's say we've got... Uh, 50 families. We want to know, uh, don't tell us how much they give, right. but of those 50 families, how much of them are regular givers? Okay. And then we break it down, and I really appreciate one elder who's really good at the finances. Mm-hmm. He will break it down and he will say, okay, of these, and I, I'm going far enough back, I don't remember, but let's say we have 50 families, and let's say 32 of them are active givers. Then he would break it down and say, uh, two of these Givers, giving units, give more than twenty thousand dollars a year, mm. and then we have five that fall, fall between fifteen thousand mm-hmm. and twenty thousand. And he breaks it down that way, and then th- that's all I wanted to know because if you know less than ten percent of our people give a certain amount, and and then another fifty percent don't give anything, right. and then the remaining forty percent, if you took the monies that are given. And then you look at your, uh, the demographics of your society, the culture you live in, and you, you figure, okay, let's say that they are giving 10%. Then okay. that means people in our church are living on $100 a week <laughs> because <laughs> if their offerings oh, represent 10%. Yeah. So what that tells me is I've got my job cut out for me yeah. <laughs> as far as under this principle because it's not about the money. It's about you and your relationship with God and how much you trust God. Right. And if it breaks down to you're chump changing God, right. then that means you don't really trust God. This is a great barometer of where your heart mm, is. Yeah. Right? So what do you say for the people, and I've fallen into this camp before in my life and I've had to work through it, right? What do you say for the people who are like, well, I would give, but I'm just not so sure about this cause. You know, how do I trust, you know, do I have to give it to this church? Cause I just don't oh, know if, good yeah, point. Yeah. Good know, point. And that, that can stifle us, I know, and say, well, I'm not sure that there's a place out there that I trust enough to give to, but okay. how much validity is there to that? Very good point. We made three notes after the discussion last, and this is one of those points, is who you give the money to. Does it make a difference? Yes, it does. Uh, but 
isn't the example of the widow's might, the widow's offering. She was giving it to uh, the temple at that time. They had, if you read in the text, they had these trumpets. They call them trumpets. And they called them trumpets because they were literally shaped like the mouth of a trumpet. Right. And when you put coins in these trumpet-shaped uh, containers, they would make a lot of noise, draw a lot of attention. But the reason they had so many offering containers is you could designate your giving. So when you gave money at the temple, you didn't just give them money. You could give money to uh, help the poor. You could give uh, money for certain designated, uh, 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 whatever the discretion of your heart was at that time, what you wanted to give to. Mm -hmm. Okay, having said that, is there a principle? Should I just give it? And it's, okay, I, I sent my money to, you know, uh, the guy on TV who prayed that God would stop COVID-19 because I yeah. really liked his prayer or whatever. Is that good enough? No. <laughs> I, I, I don't mean to be overly bold here, but l let me suggest this one principle. When uh, somebody came to Jesus and asked to be his follower, uh, it's very interesting to me. Jesus handpicked some men to be his followers, but then he had other people who wanted to come be his follower. And when you find this back and forth between Jesus and who, people who wanted to follow him, he turns to him and says, you know, uh, foxes have holes, birds have nests, son of man has no place to lay his head. But there's another man, so, so he's, he's in essence saying, you know what, it's going to be a lot of sacrifice. It's going to be harder than you think. But I love this one where he's calling somebody and the person that he's calling says, well, let me go bury my father. Oh, yeah. And Jesus turns to him and says, let the dead bury the dead. Mm. And I really think People do get a little bit of seriousness here, but the gravity here is huge because, uh, you know, somebody dying in your family and commentators are divided. Maybe maybe the, the father was just terribly sick and he hadn't died yet. You know, they, they go out on a limb here. And I don't think we have to because any way you cut this, this is something serious. Yeah. Does Jesus care about families who have lost loved ones? Of course he does. This is a big deal. The point he is making here is a principle, though, that I want us to get, and that's this. I don't care how important the issue is. The gospel's more important. Yeah. You go yeah. and preach the kingdom, right? Yeah. yeah. So what, let the dead bury that. So what do you mean by dead versus thank dead? You, thank yeah. you. Okay. Here, here's my point. Uh, the, the way I've always put it, you let the spiritually dead take care of the dead things. And what I mean by that is, uh, let's take the Red Cross, for example. The Red Cross does some wonderful stuff for people in times of need. Okay. But do they tell anybody about Jesus? No, that's not their mission. Their mission is to go in and take care of flood victims, of storm damage, of people in physical needs. Uh, you, you know what? That's right up there with a grieving family and somebody who's died and stuff like that in their family. Things, is that yeah. a need that needs to be taken care of? Yeah. Guess what? There are people who are not Christians who will take care of that. You let the spiritually dead take care of the dead, but you go and take care of the kingdom of God. So uh, I, I really do think that we have to ask ourselves the question, hey, if I were to give money to the hospital, for example, you know what, is that something good? Are they doing good? Sure it is. Yeah. But there are, are there a lot of people, are there organizations that would give a lot of money to the hospital that won't give any money to let people know about Jesus? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are. Yeah. There are a lot of people who are support St. Jude's Hospital, the Red Cross, all sorts of quote unquote good causes. I'm not arguing that they're not good causes. Causes, yeah. what I am saying is it's not the gospel. Yeah. And so, People of the gospel need to let the dead bury the dead. I don't mean that to be too harsh. I simply mean you let people who won't support Christianity support all this good stuff. Mm -hmm. And you save your money, your offering to get the gospel out there. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so what kind of ministries strategic. actually get the gospel out there? I think, I think that's something we have to pursue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that makes sense too. We have, we have the ability to, cause sometimes I think we're a little too standoffish. We think, Oh, I've done my duty because I've dropped money in, but we don't stop to think about what is that money going for? And are you praying for that money to make a difference? And what kind of difference do you even want it to make? Do you want someone to be healthier? That's a good thing. But if they don't know Jesus and then they go into eternity with a healthy body right now, that's not going to benefit them at all. You know? It's exactly right. So it, it gives exactly us a right. chance to be more invested in what our 
our money is doing, which I think is good. And I, I, I do think it's good. And let me just uh, squeeze this in too. If mm-hmm. uh, you're working with another church, I, I really think the leadership of the church, we, we regularly, uh, maybe not as much as we should, but we ask for financial statements from our missionaries because yeah, we believe our missionaries are doing some good work. But if we found right. out later that we gave so many thousands of dollars and it went to purchase two Rolls Royces for the uh, <laughs> uh, missionary's sons, you know what? I'd think like we weren't doing our job. So, yeah, so, yeah, you know, stewardship wise. So. <laughs> and, and you can't deny that a lot of churches and a lot of marriages fall because of money issues. Yes. Right. So we we don't want to be naive to that. And and I think it's important to point out, sometimes I'll tell people this too, like, Hey, if you are any way concerned about there being impure motives, you can give straight to another mission or another church or whatever. The point, the point is you need to be giving to supporting the gospel getting out there. It doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to somehow come through me or to this particular place. That's not what we're dealing with here. I, I did want to ask you though, um, is it fair to say that God is only concerned about your tithe or is it fair to say that he's concerned about the money that you're not giving to? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Cause there are a couple other items we wanted to button up here. That number one is, is what do they do with the money that you give? Are you responsible? I think, yeah, being a good steward, you are. Number two, I give, let's say I set aside 25%. Gave that to a ministry. Now I get to spend the 75% on my own? <laughs> well, what did what does the Bible tell us? You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. Therefore, <laughs> glorify God with your bodies. Mm. Uh, whatever you give away is one thing. What you keep is also something that you need to use to glorify God. Right. So um, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm not sorry. I, nah, I just wish you everybody would you. get the gravity of this. Everything belongs to God. Everything belongs to God. Some of it you need to let go of, give it away. Uh, you make it sound the, like I'm not owning my money, but I'm just managing it. Uh, hey, <laughs> hey, First Corinthians chapter 4, uh, first few uh, verses, we are managers of everything that we've got. And it says in that passage, a manager has to be held accountable. Mm. So God's going to look at what you keep as well as what you give away. So uh, there have been many times where I stress more over what I keep than what I give away. <laughs> and uh, I, I try to set aside a certain amount, give it away. And actually, just be honest with you guys, that's the easy part. Oh, yeah. Because it's kind of like, yeah, here you go. I gave it away. Now, the stuff that I kept, it's kind of like, should I really buy that size TV? <laughs> you know, I could get by with a smaller one yeah, and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. But it's such but a good deal. But I justify these things, you know, I, I whatever. I can, I can share the message of Jesus <laughs> on this bigger TV. Yeah, from farther away. Yeah. Yep. In, in brighter, more dynamic color than yeah. you've ever seen before. You guys are laughing, alive. but I have literally justified, you oh, know, yeah. I'm going to give my old TV to this person. So therefore, yeah. I'm going to buy a new one. From wow. You know what? I go Dad, down there. Dad Trail, gave me sorry. his old TV and I am not complaining at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So the, the uh, percent that we keep, we have to give an account for everything that we've got. Not only everything we've got, every minute of the day, uh, our whole lives. Mm. Uh, here we are, living sacrifices. Right. Romans chapter twelve, and, and that's why I think it's two. key. And and this, uh, let's bring it back to where we've been talking about. This is yes. what the church did together. Yes, this is what mm. we did. Because how? I mean, that's that's kind of absurd to say, hey, Mike, by the way, you're accountable to every single minute of every day, every dollar that you should give and that you keep and every little aspect of your life. You're accountable for all of it. So don't mess up. Don't mismanage any of it. Blah, yeah. blah, blah. You just go on. That is quite a tall order. And so that's why we have other things like what was it? Galatians right around five and six, you know, bear one another's burdens yes. or yes. or other things like that. Yes. This is what the church did together. And this is an exercise, something that we get to grow together in this is not something that i believe anyone can handle effectively all by themselves Uh, there's just so much to do i need people looking at my back saying hey seth you're doing good here you're struggling there let me let me point this out to you let me help you and we really do encourage spur each other on 
like uh, you were talking about in that Hebrews uh, 10 passage. That's know? right. You know, the really visual image comes to my mind. Have you seen those videos where uh, maybe a little kid gets uh, sucked under a car or there's some, been some accident and a whole bunch of people jump out of their cars? Yeah. And all these people that any one of them probably couldn't pick up 100 pounds, but you yeah. get a whole swarm of people <laughs> and they literally lift a car up. And right, yeah. right, right. I just love that image because that's the church. Mm. You know, we're better together. We put our resources together. We give mm -hmm. our time together. We do all these things together. Yeah. Yes, and uh, yes. let, me, let me summarize before we move on because uh, uh, I, I do want us to move on from talking about money. But, uh, Got some discipline I, to deal with. Okay, yeah. But let's make one more comment. Uh, I, I think a good way to summarize a lot of what the Bible says about giving is this idea of a godly gap. Hmm. And uh, you, you mentioned that to me in break. I always love that. I don't remember where I heard that first, but I, I love that concept. And they, here's the concept. If you picture a line like on a, on a piece of paper and it represents the way you could live, a standard of living, right? I make a certain amount of money and with that amount of money, my budget, I could afford this kind of car. I can afford to live in this kind of a house or apartment. I can afford to go out to eat this amount of times, this kind of clothes. I, here's the standard, right? I shop at Walmart, Goodwill, <laughs> or what are okay. those other places? But that, that line, you know, yeah. mental line or on a paper or whatever, yes, you have yes. a line. If, if you were to go out and Collar. buy an airplane, you know what? You're way beyond your line right. because you, you can't afford it. But you know where your, well, your line is, Your line's is, pretty right? high up there. I don't okay, know. now picture that line and then come way down. And I challenge you to come way down hmm. and draw another line and say, you know what? Uh, I, don't, I don't live in this smaller house and I don't drive a used car, but I, if I did drive a used car and I only went out to eat once a week and I shopped at Walmart or whatever, you know, and I'm just, I'm just pulling them out of the hat here. Yeah. But if you drew a line down here and said, man, if I lived that way, I'd have a whole bunch of money left over. Huh. Well, you know what? You've just created a gap a line where you could live and a line where you choose to live. And the difference is, I'm just gonna give this to God. We call mm -hmm. it a godly gap. Now, what does that mean? It's gonna be different for different people. And again, I'd like to emphasize this. You cannot look at other people and say, well, they don't have enough godly gap. You don't know. <laughs> they may have a huge uh, godly gap, yeah. but you know what? God keeps blessing their lives. Yeah, when well, if they're doing it right, you probably won't That's know right. that much. Yeah, I right? just think the way you could live and the way you choose to live, you create a gap in there and you give that to God, and I really do think that's a principle. God, it's called worship, and I think God will uh, bless people because of it. And one of those blessings, I think, is a mental one as well. It it feels <laughs> good. It really feels good to to look and see, man, I'm got this area down. I don't have everything down, but I don't know. I can just speak from experience. There are times there are times when, and I can go a little bit too far with this because I struggle with laziness too, but I can look at things in my house and be like, Oh yeah, there's another thing falling apart. Oh look, <laughs> there's another project that really should be fixed at some point in time, but it's not done. But then if I stopped and think, well, hold on a second. I didn't get to that because I was busy doing uh, something else. Ministry related, ministry. Yeah. Or was, I was trying to help out <laughs> someone else in need or some other thing like that. Yeah. All of a sudden that thing that did bother me, I've learned to look at some things and be like, Hmm, I'm kind of happy about that drywall that needs to be patched over there. <laughs> you know what? I, yeah. it hasn't really hurt me, <laughs> Yeah. but seeing yeah. it there reminds me that I'm not number one and, mm. and that my drywall is not the drywall that gets priority here. Right. Or right. plaster as your home. Yes, yes, yes. So what, what are we talking? We want to get into discipline, right? Yeah, let's go ahead and go from one happy subject to another. <laughs> yes, definitely. How is the church? All right, so the church isn't all about money, but God has a lot to say about it. So we need to clarify that issue. But discipline, you made it sound like the church is coming together to be judgmental. And I thought that was the very thing that people didn't like about the church. Right. So we need to clarify. Okay. What, what do we mean? Okay. Uh, the church did come together to exercise discipline. They were told to come together to exercise discipline. We are going to look at that classic example in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. But first, I want to start in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, because you cannot have godly discipline if you don't understand the principle of judging. And <laughs> let me just kind of throw it out here on the table. Much of this is condemning and it's not judging the way God wants us to. Uh, judgment is simply to make an assessment of somebody else. And even the most non-judgmental people constantly are assessing other people. You cannot get away from it. Oh, yeah. So let's, let's do this as 
godly as we possibly can. And the, the principles of how we're going to do this, I think Jesus lays them out here in Matthew chapter 7. So let's go to this classic, can I, can I say, misunderstood? The one that everyone can quote now. Oh, yeah. At least the first part. Yeah, first Matthew part. chapter 7, verse 1, do not judge or you too will be judged. And they stop right there. And if that's the only thing Jesus said, well, that'd be, wow. But listen, <laughs> listen, I mean, you know, just reading this whole passage, he's yeah. going to talk about true and false prophets, and he's going to say, don't be fooled by the false prophet. How in the world can you do that if you don't judge? People and say, hey, that's a good one, that's a bad one. He's asking us to make right. those kind of judgments. Right. But you don't even have to go that far. Let me continue reading. It says, do not judge or you too will be judged, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, you will, you, it will be measured to you. Sorry, I'm having a hard time spitting this out. <laughs> but let's, let's lay out the first principle here. Principle number one, well, uh, principle number one in the first verse is he's saying don't judge the way most people do it. Right. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. Number two, he's saying just understand this, the, the standard you use, the measure you use for somebody else, that's what they're going to use on you. And I remember hearing a sermon a long time ago where the preacher said, now, think about this. Let's say you really messed up. Okay. Somebody needs to call you to account. How do you want them to do that? And I immediately thought to myself, well, I, I know how I want to be judged. <laughs> Number one, I don't want it to happen in public. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want somebody to pull me aside. Number two, I, I want them to put their arm around me. Right. And I want them to say, Mark, you do a pretty good job most of the time. <laughs> most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. I want him, I want him to emphasize the good stuff. <laughs> There's 10 and things then, I like about you. Yeah. <laughs> and then this number three, you lack. I want him to I say, a, yeah. you know, everybody messes up sometimes. And, <laughs> you know, I know you didn't mean it, Mark, but you really messed up here. Right. And I just, because I care about you, I want to tell you. That. You know, that's, that's the way I want somebody to approach me. Yeah. Right? And he's saying, listen, you keep that in mind when you approach somebody else. The same way you judge others, that's the measure, that's the way they're going to judge you. Verse three. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Okay, Here we go. a lot of commentators make a lot out of this, but let's just stick with the basic principle. And the basic principle is this. Don't go looking at other people until you look at yourself. Amen. Right? Mm -hmm. right? Right? So it's really going to be hard for me with a cigarette danging out of my mouth and blowing smoke in your face to tell you you smoke too much. That's bad for right? you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you get the, okay, that was a... Pretty anyway, obvious. Yeah, right, right, right. But, but the same idea. You know, you gotta, you gotta have enough genuineness, yeah. enough authenticity to say, yeah, uh, listen, uh, everybody sins. I sin. I'm really working on it. Other people have helped me. I need to help you too. Right, but you got to work on your own stuff if you're not working on your own stuff. So the measure you use, number two, uh, working on your own stuff. Verse four, how can you say to your brother, "Let me take the speck out of your eye," when all the time the plank's in your own eye? Got to be working on your own stuff. Verse five, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then leave your brother alone. Yeah. It's not what it says. Think you just <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. He says, yeah. take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. That's right. A lot of people don't read that far. Yeah. We are supposed to be helping get the specks out of our brother's eyes. Yeah, and you can't do it when there's a plank in your own can't eye. Can't do it. The you plank. can't see too You've well. You've got to address your own self, and a lot of times somebody else has to help me pull that plank out of my eye. Right. right? So I've got to be open to this. I've got to use the same measure. got to be in a loving way. But at the end of the day, Jesus is saying, one of the best things we can do is to judge others. In fact, before we go to the New Testament example, let's flip over to Luke 17. Because there's a reminder in Luke 17 that I, I just love. Luke chapter 17, the first few verses here. Uh, Jesus says to his disciples, I'm starting in verse 1 of Luke 17. Uh, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. I love that reminder. You know what? Some people are going to get in trouble. You better not be the reason they get in trouble, right? <laughs> yeah. It better not be you. Verse 2, he says, It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourself. Don't you mess other people up, right? Here's his guidance. Here's, here's the specific thing he's talking about. He says, If your brother or sister sins against you, he says, Rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times a day, seven times come back saying, I repent, you must forgive them. Okay, 
most people read this passage and they get okay if somebody sins and they say, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to forgive them. But they miss the first thing Jesus said. He didn't just say, if they repent, forgive them. The first thing he said is, if they sin, you rebuke them. Uh, Number one, you rebuke them. Right. So what does that mean? It means, go back to Matthew chapter 7, in a loving way, whatever you, way you would want other people to do to you. Right. Right? But you still got to call them out. Right. You call them out, and then they repent, and they ask for forgiveness. You forgive them. And then he, his apostles said to him, uh, increase our faith. <laughs> and in other words, they're saying, ooh, that's tough. Can you make it easier? And Jesus says, if you had the faith as small as a mustard seed. In other words, Jesus is saying, no, I'm not going to increase your faith. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to make this easier. You just do it, right? Yeah. He says, if you had faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. Mulberry trees in the first century were like pepper trees in Florida. Every time you cut one down and you try to get rid of it, it grows back. Mm -hmm. Just keeps coming back. It was kind of a metaphor that represented those issues in your life that just keeps coming back. Right. Right. They just keep coming back. And Jesus, I think, is saying, you know what, church? You know what, Christian? Some of these issues you keep struggling with, if you would just rebuke, mm. judge, right. and forgive, you know what? Some of those issues would start going oh, away. Boy. So You make me want to throw out there too because a lot, of, a lot of passages are not read in context. And Matthew chapter 18 is another one I tend Ooh, to think good. of. I hear verse 20 of Matthew 18 read a lot or quoted a lot, especially after a good song service or, yes. or a good prayer yes. service. And it says, for where two or three gather in my name, <laughs> oh, yeah. there I am with them. I and that's a passage that a lot of us have heard time and time again, but we can easily forget. And it shocked me when I read this not that long ago to hear the context of this passage. Skip back a few verses. All the, the beginning of this section is verse 15. And it says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses if they still refuse to listen tell it to the church and if they refuse to listen even to the church treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector i mean that that is methodically going through the line of how you should in appropriate stages hopefully to restore them uh make a judgment that's right and then he ends up for where two or three gather together in my name there i am with them right it's not nearly as emotionally pleasant uh, when you read that passage in context, but the importance of this being done the right way, church you know, comes if, together. If we would to do stop that, judging yeah. hypocritically, right, and start ju- because one of the things that really compels me is you know my my buddy Mike across the table here kind of made this point last week. Uh-oh. You know, if if someone's got a big old booger hanging out their nose, <laughs> oh, and you man. don't and you don't say anything about it, you're just like, okay. look at that, that's ridiculous. Oh, he's about to go in public. I'm just going to watch. <laughs> People that really care about you are going to be the ones that say, Hey, by the way, I just want you to be aware, you know, that's something you do for a friend or someone that you at least want to be friendly toward. You don't let them be embarrassed or suffer like that. And that's kind of, if that's true, just in regular life, how much more true is that in your relationship with God? Do you really want to have a glaring problem that's, that's uh, in the way, right? Right. It's not something we want. I know we we still haven't gotten into that uh, passage in Corinthians yet, but we'll have to do that next time because we're almost out of time. But when we get back together again, hopefully we'll clarify this. This is the kind of judging appropriate assessment, appropriate helping each other to make us better. Yes. It's Mm -hmm. done right. If it's done right, it's so encouraging. It's so helpful and it makes us who we need to be. So we'll talk more about that next time. Okay.